On May the 5th, 1936, the Italian troops of Marshal Badoglio entered Addis Ababa, bombing, machine gunning, and guessing this country into submission. Goliath had won the first round. Over this countryside for five years, he sent out his punitive columns to keep his Philistinian peace. But the revolt went on against the dizzy background of the Abyssinian mountains, where the people waited in extraordinary competence for the day when their own monarchy should return and the tyrant's flag should be pulled down. Four years later, an aircraft unknown to the Abyssinian came over the western horizon. It dropped no bombs. Sheaves of yellow paper fluttered through the upland sunlight down to the plateau. They were stamped with the seal of the Lion of Judah, Haile Selassie I. My beloved people, they read, I rejoice to announce to you that I am once again among you. I have come with the invincible might of Britain. This verse from the Psalms of David is the watchword of our revolt. Ethiopia raises her hands towards God. Drums beat out the signal. Ethiopia raises her hands from tableland to tableland. Messengers, servants of the great chiefs of Ethiopia, who in many provinces had not submitted to the Italians, spread the news also to the villages. And the Ethiopians pulled out the old rifles that had lain in the thatch of their houses when the Italian police passed through. They saddled their horses and mules, harnessed them into fierce bits of war and hurried to the chieftain's camp. This was the Abyssinian mobilization, the formation of the famous Patriot Army in its rags and its bare feet which struck such fear into the Italians and crumbled their resistance behind the battle line. Where at Keren and on the Juba River, in Asmara and Hara, the British regular war machine was pounding their weary troops. And this is the headquarters of the man who at his Empress command held up the flag of Ethiopian liberty for five years. Ras Ababa Aragai, in 1935 and 1936, chief of the Addis Ababa police. A quiet, astute, gentle-voiced officer, incapable of shouting duce duce in any language. One of the bravest men in the modern world. Ababa Aragai has spent the past five years never more than a hundred miles from Addis Ababa. With a price on his head, he's been wounded in battle half a dozen times. He's foiled more than one Italian expedition of 15,000 men. And now the promised arms are coming. British rifles with British bands, all sorts, Martinis, Lee Medfords, Lee Enfields, and American rifles, Springfields. It was the chance shipment from America that gave the first armed impetus to the revolt and captured Italian rifles in their thousands. Few lost lessons in guerrilla warfare from the Ras Ababa Araga. Don't be foolish, he says, as many of you were in 1935 and 1936. Don't go and mass in front of their machine guns. In five years, we've learned a lesson or two in mountain fighting, the night attack, the war of nerves, and of unnerving shrieks in the dark. The war of light hand grenades stolen from the Italians. The attack on the flank, the ambush from the stone sand. That long hair on your heads is the badge of the Arbenia, the Ethiopian guerrilla fighter. It is the outward sign of your form as irregular soldiers. Now into the lorries, troops, rifles, bayonets, provisions and all. And we'll show the Italians what we mean by Ethiopian independence. The Patriot armies whip up their arms, food and drink. Beer made of Abyssinian barley, called Tala, and mead made of Abyssinian honey, called Tej. Meanwhile, the Ras gives orders to his staff. The women bring small sacks of millet to cook cakes, and the dried peas called Shimbara that are Ethiopia's hardest rations. The women and the children are going to battle with the men. The little boy carries his father's rifle until the moment when father thinks that he can draw a bead on an eye tie. If father dies, then the rifle belongs to the little boy. Mother and son will give father a good Christian burial on the battlefield. They're stoical, but they're optimistic also. Perhaps they think it'll be the Italian who will lie stiff under our independent African stars. And then we'll have another rifle in the family for little brother to carry. 
This is the great seal of the realm. Around, in Amharic letters, are the titles of imperial authority. Haile Selassie I, king of the kings of Ethiopia, elect of God, the Lion of Judah has conquered. It is the proof that the emperor, the seed of Solomon and of Sheba, has returned to take up his whole people in his hand. The Emperor Haile Selassie has crossed the great trench of the Blue Nile with two regular battalions of Sudanese and Ethiopians, with a cloud of patriots on either flank, with British officers whose daring ranks with that of Lawrence. Without one piece of artillery or one tank, he has defeated and demoralized the 30,000 Italian troops who held the western province of Gojam. He is 100 miles from Addis Ababa, into which the victorious army of General Cunningham has driven. The emperor has come to feature. He is near Deborah Libanus, one of the holy places of central Ethiopia, where the Italians in 1937 machine gunned to death 400 Ethiopian monks and chucked them into a common grave, where also his cousins, the sons of his principal Ras, Kassa, were executed by the Italians in the same year. His field commander is at his right hand, and on his left is the new British commander of his bodyguard. This is the heart of Christian Ethiopia, that island of Christianity, as the Emperor Menelik expressed it, in a sea of paganism for 1,500 years. And the Emperor, installed upon his throne, is head of the Ethiopian Coptic Church and superintends its ritual. Not greatly like our Christianity, you may say. The priests wear turbans and process under umbrellas with their silver-topped dancing sticks in their hands and their silver musical instruments that tap out the harsh refrain of the Coptic Psalms. The Psalms of David, the music and the rhythm of David himself as he danced before the Ark of the Covenant. These are as much a part of the Ethiopian church as is the New Testament. A touch of the modern world. An English wireless operator takes down a message from the British command in Addis Ababa. It's an important message. It means the collapse of the Italian resistance in Ethiopia. It's good news to the head of the British military mission to Abyssinia, who at nearly 60 years of age entered Abyssinia almost single-handed in August 1940, and hunted by the Italians, laid all the staff work for the revolt. Meanwhile, Ras Ababa rides at the head of his army to join his emperor. Dessier has fallen. The Duke of Aosta is in flight. We have captured more than 40 boxes of his personal baggage. Italian prestige will never stand up to this shock at the top. And so the road to Addis Ababa is open, except for a demoralized force of Italians in the valley ahead that the emperor and his commander in the field will have to bypass or drive through. From Addis Ababa comes General Cunningham, brother of the officer commanding the Mediterranean fleet, who by his staggering advance from Kenya to Mogadishu, Mogadishu to Harar, Harar to Addis Ababa, has set up new records in military speed and a shattered army is numerically three times as strong as his own. This is the first time that the Emperor and the General have met, and it is the first junction of the forces from the Sudan and from Kenya. And there is a hearty abandonment of beards on the part of the British officers. Antonio, the captured Italian barber, is happy, for he knows he's out of harm's way. Frankly, he was just a little scared when he saw the long hair looming over the horizon. But nobody wishes Antonio any harm. He was just a helpless propaganda oil cog in the Italian machine. <laughs> 